It's a God who shaped the earth and heavens. Your glory shines in all that you have made. You spoke the word who broke into the darkness. All earth replies, majestic is your name. visitors who are up um, visiting. Um, we're going to look at the stars a little bit this week. Strange topic, isn't it? I don't know if you've read ahead into Isaiah 40 uh, in advance of this week's sermon. But as a warm-up, I want to, um, so Sam's going to do some roving mic stuff for me, but this might be more of a question for the grown-ups than for the, for the kids in the room. But have any of you seen anything cool in the night sky? So in real life, so I'm not talking about, you know, documentaries. Have any of you ever been outside with a big telescope or somewhere far north, seen the aurora borealis or seen shooting stars or any of that kind of stuff? Shove your hand up and Sam will come and you can tell us a little bit about what you saw. Gemma, what have you seen? Um, I saw the red spot on Jupiter. You saw the red spot on Jupiter? Yeah. With your naked eye? Um, well, through a telescope. Through a massive yeah. telescope. <laughs> yeah, that was going to say that would be good eyesight. So you saw it, like, just through a telescope. Where was that and when? Um, Brilliant. That's a good flex, isn't it? When I was in New Zealand, yeah, yeah. I saw Jupiter. <laughs> Brilliant. That sounds pretty cool. Isaac, what have you seen? We're just going to make Sam run now. Um, I saw Mars. You saw Mars? Was that through a telescope too? Um, no, we just saw it in the sky. Okay, so you, you could tell by the stars. Did it look like a star? Yeah? Brilliant. Jesse, what have you seen? You've seen the moon, and sometimes when it's low in the sky, it looks absolutely massive, doesn't it? Yeah, that's cool. Uh, Harry? Now, if we could just have someone in that corner over here so Sam gets the maximum amount of steps. Uh, I think last year I saw, I think, three planets were in the sky. So three other planets? I don't know if you failed them. I managed to see three of them. That is brilliant, isn't it? So, hang on a minute. Nobody in the room has ever seen a shooting star in real life. Oh, you have. You just don't want to put your hands up. Brilliant. Dave, tell me about when you saw a shooting star. Well, the reason I didn't put my hand up is because I didn't know, couldn't remember where it was or where it was. But 
Yeah. Cool story. <laughs> so Dave has definitely probably seen a shooting star at some point. Dan, come on, give us a good one. Um, I actually saw a fireball once where a meteor broke up. Um, that was at the Stony Bible Conference, and it was obviously at night, and just over the line of the trees, yeah. it was just a shooting star, and it just broke into pieces. Wow, that is, a cool, that is a cool thing to see. I would like to have seen that. Has anybody seen the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis? Sarah? Where were you? Were you in Canada? No, I was in Cumbria. You were in Cumbria? Yeah. They said last week or the week before that you could see them pretty much from here if you went out at the right time and it was clear enough. So sometimes you can see them this far south. No, I was in Cumbria and I nearly crashed the car because I was too busy driving. <laughs> in my head, I had this beautiful picture of you in a field looking at the lights, but you were driving a car and there they were. Brilliant. Um, the night, oh, George, come on, one more. I can't say no to George ever. Otherwise, he might stop and put his hand up and he yeah, saves me. I was in Lapland, I saw, um, I, saw, uh, I saw the Milky Way and I saw the um, Hercules. Um, wow, where were you? Was this from your window? Uh, no, Lapland. Oh, in Lapland. I thought you said lockdown. That makes more sense. I was like, wow. Usually the streetlights stop me seeing all of those things. Brilliant. Like, I think all of us have had a dark night. Maybe you've been camping or you've been out in the woods or whatever else, and you've caught a glimpse of the night sky. For the people um, in Bible times, it would have been much more common for them to go outside and see the stars in a way that I think in our cities we just don't do that so much. Um, let me read a few verses from Psalm 147, though, uh, as we think about the God who made the stars. Listen to these words. This is what he's like. So the psalmist says, Praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Even in just a few verses of the psalm there, we see two amazing truths. We've got a God who is powerful enough that he gets to name the stars. These great big balls of gas that we can't even get our heads around. He just gets to call them by name. And they're all there because he wants them to be. And at the same time, he binds up the brokenhearted. He lifts up the humble. This is the God that we've come together to worship this morning. So we're going to sing a bit of a Christmas song, just because, you know, it's that time of year. We're going to go into Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We don't get a chance to sing, like the psalmist said, but every time we listen and we can't sing, let's long for the day that we get to join our voices together and do what the psalmist says and sing God's praises. So we're going to listen to the, to the band now and to Navcha as she sings for us, um, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
if you knew the fourth verse off by heart there. <laughs> it is good for us to come and give God praise, isn't it? Yeah, it might have been a Christmas song, but we get to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus, the God who created the heavens and the earth. He came and was God with us in flesh. That's incredible, isn't it? And as we come to him this morning, we can't help but realise that we are not like he is. We're going to see that as we turn to Isaiah later. Uh, that we don't get to tell God what to do. He is the Almighty One. So let me pray a prayer of confession as we come to him and recognise that we are not quite um, the people that we ought to be. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we bow our heads now to confess our sins. While we were just reminded of the angel's message, glory to the newborn king, we realise that at times this week we have not lived for your glory, before our own. We haven't related to the people who we love the most out of a joy that our relationship with you has been restored. We're sorry for all the ways this week that we have been selfish or unkind. And yet, Lord, thank you for the message of the angels, the good news that says our sins can be forgiven because Jesus came. Thank you that our place together this morning in your church family is not dependent on our own perfection, but on the salvation that you give to us through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, that as we are joined to Jesus by faith, so we receive his perfect righteousness. And so, Lord, we ask this morning that we might glorify your Son, even as you work in us by your Spirit. Amen. Let's continue worshipping. Be 
So before we go into the reading and the sermon, we've got something that we don't normally do on a Sunday morning and something that is not easy to do in these COVID times. Um, it's actually the final weekend that the Shokos are here in Liverpool with us. So some of you would know that already, some of you don't know that already. Um, we got a chance to say a kind of a physical farewell to them at Families on the Floor this morning, uh, but obviously not all of you guys were able to be there. Uh, so what I've got them to do is I've got them to record a little video for us. So that we're going to play a little two-minute clip now uh, where they get a chance to say goodbye to us at least a little bit um, and share a couple of prayer points uh, for them as they move on down to London. So rather than me talk anymore, why don't we listen to what they've got to say? Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's the show course here. It's time for us to say goodbye to you all. We are moving to London in exactly one week. I'll be studying at London Business School. We arrived uh, in Liverpool two years ago as a family of four, but we now live as a family of five, having added this uh, little chatter box here. But beyond that, we actually live as a much larger family thanks to you. We had a really wonderful um, experience in ATC and we'll share some of that occasion. My favorite thing was coloring things. My favorite thing was making the tallest, the tallest and strongest towers. Yeah, we are truly grateful for so much at Exeth Community Church and it will always be a part of our family. And we are particularly thankful for the rich uh, biblical teaching that we've received here, the spiritual nourishment and also um, the rich hospitality and friendships that we have here. And our prayer would be that we would receive this again in London. You guys have really raised the bar for us. So, um, yeah, but we do ask that that would be a provision from God and also that we could serve well in London um, despite it being a really busy year. And then we would also ask that we could leave here well, um, that you'd pray for us as we leave to love you guys well, to say goodbye well, and to stay in contact well. And, um, yeah, please know that our door is always open wherever we are and do come and visit. No. But for now, it is see you later. And, and Merry Christmas, everyone. Bye. 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 Joseph must have a career in something, the self-control he had. <laughs> it was incredible. Um, I'm going to give you just a little moment to say those prayers now, because if you do it now, it might remind you to do it in the future as well, and we can continue to pray for them. So let me give you just a moment to pray for yourse yourselves for the Shokos, um, and then I'll close. Uh, for the Shoko family, uh, for what they've brought to our church family while they've been with us. Father, we thank you for their warmth and their humility, their generosity. Father, we thank you for their outward-looking spirit and their desire to see your name uh, go out into their community. Father, we pray for them with this move coming up, and we ask, Father, that you would help them find uh, a church in London where they can grow under your word, where they can serve with the gifts that you've given them, where they can continue to reach out into their community with the good news of Jesus. And Father, we do pray for the whole leaving process. Lord, we ask that you would help them uh, to say goodbye well to us. Father, would you help us to do the hard work of saying goodbye well to them and staying in touch with them. Father, I pray that some of the relationships they've made with us here uh, might persist and, and continue and that they might be used by you for the work of your kingdom. And we pray this all uh, to you, our almighty God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Brilliant. So Sarah is going to come now and she's going to read God's word for us. So Isaiah 40. Good morning. It's lovely to see you all. Um, so we're in Isaiah chapter 40, starting at verse 12. 
Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see, who created these? He brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Well, let me um, add my seamless welcome to Tommy's this morning. It's good to have you uh, with us. Nice to have you if you're joining us on the YouTube channel as well. Thanks for following along. It's sad to be saying goodbye to the showcase when they're not even in the room, isn't it? It's uh, sad that they're leaving. We, uh, we will pray for you as you leave, guys, and we will be uh, following your progress. Um, hopefully, they'll come back to Liverpool as well and see us at some point over the course of the year, so we'll get to uh, see them then. We're in Isaiah 40 this morning, so you want to leave that passage open in front of you. Uh, We are looking at it this week and next week. That's our plan, um, Lord willing, to uh, finish off Isaiah 40 in the run-up to Christmas. Let me pray for our time in God's Word together. Let's pray. Gracious God, we, uh, we sit and I stand here really aware of our neediness, our weakness. We don't want to pretend that we don't have that. And so, Lord, we ask that you would be gracious to us and speak to us from your word. Strengthen us. Help us to live for you. Help us to grasp even just a small part of what you're like. And as we try and understand this passage and even think thoughts about you, may you, Lord, please be at work in us by your spirit. For the glory of your name. Amen. Well, um, in a desperate attempt to make this a bit more Christmassy, let me start with what is my favourite Christmas reading, which is Luke chapter 1. Let me see whether I can get that uh, onto there. There you go. Uh, Luke chapter 1, I don't really know whether you've read it recently, but uh, in Luke 1, he contrasts Zechariah with Mary. You know the 
the beginning of Luke's Gospel. So uh, Zechariah is the, the highly intelligent, learned priest who has the privilege of being on duty in the temple. And Mary is a humble nobody, probably even still just a teenager. Uh, her only claim to fame is that she's distantly related to Zechariah, who's on duty in the temple that year. And both of them are visited by the angel Gabriel. And both of them are promised miraculous children. Zechariah, through the more ordinary means of his wife becoming pregnant, but miraculously because they're both uh, well past childbearing age. Mary, more complexly, will uh, have a baby by the Holy Spirit. Now, the contrast comes in their responses to the message of the angel Gabriel. Zechariah says, how's that going to work? Mary says, let it be done to your servant according to your word. Now, as Luke tells the story, and he tells it brilliantly, I, I read it and I have a lot of sympathy for Zechariah. Maybe you do too. I mean, it, it's reasonable, isn't it, to doubt that he would have a baby, having waited for so long. It, it seems reasonable for him to think, well, you know, that doesn't kind of seem like that's going to happen. I think if you or I were in his shoes, we'd feel the same. But despite my sympathy for Zechariah, which I'm sure he's really delighted to have, actually, he was wrong. He was wrong to think like that. Why? Well, because as we're going to find in Isaiah 40, human reason and logic are not the great powers in our world. Let me just try and explain the significance of that, and then we'll come to Isaiah 40. Think of Zechariah as being like a, a modern 21st century bloke. Like you and me, he believes in what he can see. He trusts that experience has taught him certain things. Certain, certain things happen and other things don't happen. His logic and his reason have told him those things. You know, he doesn't believe in conspiracy theories. He uh, trusts the science. He's uh, searched for facts that he can rely on. He's not the guy who spray-painted Plandemic on the motorway bridge on the M57. He's not injecting bleach into his veins. He knows that his elderly wife is not going to have a baby. Why? Well, because nature has told him so. Science and all sensible observations tell him that that cannot possibly happen. And yet he's wrong. And if you know the story, the angel Gabriel's response is brilliant. You know, Zechariah says, hang on a minute. I'm old. My wife is old. This is not going to happen. And what does the angel Gabriel say? I stand in the presence of God. You know, put that in your sceptical pipe and smoke it, Zechariah. I speak from God, the great creator of the universe, the Lord of all things who stands above, beyond, and underneath all things that you see and experience. I've come from his presence with this message. You want to think again, Zechariah? He says, God can do whatever he pleases. Well, so for us, last week, if you were here, we heard the promises of comfort from the beginning of Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says Isaiah. Bring them the comfort and joy of knowing forgiveness, of knowing that I have a sure plan which will definitely work out. Bring them the comfort of knowing that I will be with them. And you and I channel our inner Zechariah and we go, yeah, right. You know, come on. Comfort, comfort. Have you seen how screwed up my life is? Do you not realise I've lost my job? Do you not know that I'm lonely? Do you not know that I'm absolutely dreading Christmas? Have you not noticed that we're in the middle of a global pandemic? That Brexit is a mess? That the most powerful man in the world seems to be having a temper tantrum? You know, what comfort, comfort? Are you, get real? Everything that I see, all my sensible observations tell me discomfort, discomfort. And we even know more science, don't we, than Zechariah. The miraculous intervention of a God of another dimension, come on. Well, if that's how we feel, and honestly, those are the voices that go around my head, well, then this week, this is the I stand 
in the presence of God moment. Right? This is Isaiah saying, I stand in the presence of God. Look at who God is and reconsider your skepticism. Listen to who's talking and stop doubting. So let's just see three things together about the greatness of God. The first one is this. God measures the world, we don't measure him, verses 12 to 14. Look down at the passage. Isaiah's style is to ask obvious questions to lead us to the conclusion that he is driving at. It's not like Sunday school, right? So where you know that the teacher wants you to give the right answer. So the answer to all the questions in verse 12 is God, and no one is the answer to all the questions in verses 13 and 14. So verse 12, God alone is the one for whom the waters of the oceans are just a drop in the hollow of his hand. The heavens are the span of his hand, and the earth and its mountains he can pick up and weigh. Now the point here is not so much the physical scale of God. It's not that God is like a giant man for whom his hand is so big that the trillions of gallons of the Pacific Ocean are just little droplets in the palm of his hand. Now, of course, God is spirit. He is inescapably present everywhere through his omnis- uh, omnipresence. And he doesn't have a body like that. Which means these words are trying to communicate something more than simply the physical size of God. Really, the point is that God holds the world controls the elements of the universe, and the world does not hold him or control him. Creation, verse 14, does not teach God. And we, even with all of our scientific knowledge, we do not get to measure God or to teach him what he can or cannot do in the world. That would be utterly ridiculous. You know, Elizabeth's age does not get to dictate to God what he can or cannot do through her. Zechariah was wrong to think like that. Neither can your circumstances prevent the God of comfort from promising you comfort in Christ. And to think otherwise is to put everything upside down, isn't it? Now, Isaiah's point here is that the existence of God like this is not only really central for us to understand, it should be obvious to us from the world around us. How so? Well, because the world itself points to the very fact that someone greater than the world itself is holding it together, organising it and arranging it. And if we even have a small droplet of humility, we would recognise that the person holding the world together is not us, it's not me, it's not you. Over the last few months, I've been reading Bill Bryson's book, A Short History of Nearly Everything. It's a clever uh, clever book. Uh, It's quite old now, but it's it's a fun overview of the scientific discoveries down through the years. What's amazing is you read it as a Christian, as you read it and you, you keep waiting for him to say, isn't it amazing? You know, God's greatness is painted all over the pages of the book, but he just never acknowledges it. Listen to how his book begins. Let me read to you the beginning of his book. Welcome and congratulations. I'm delighted that you could make it. Getting here wasn't easy. I know. In fact, I suspect it was a little tougher than you realise. To begin with, for you to be here now, trillions of drifting atoms had to somehow assemble into an intricate and intriguingly obliging manner to create you. It's an arrangement so specialised and particular that it has never been tried before and it will only exist this once. For the next many years, we hope, these tiny particles will uncomplainingly engage in the billions of deft cooperative efforts necessary to keep you intact and let you experience the supremely agreeable but generally underappreciated state known as existence. Why atoms take this trouble is a bit of a puzzle. Being you is not a gratifying experience at the atomic level. For all their devoted attention, your atoms don't actually care about you. Indeed, they don't even know that you're there. They don't even know that they are there. They are mindless particles, after all, not even themselves alive. It's a slightly arresting notion that if you were to pick yourself apart with tweezers, one atom at a time, you would produce a mound of fine atomic dust, none of which had ever been alive, but all of which had once been you. Yet, somehow, for the period of your existence, 
They will answer to a single overarching impulse to keep you, you. It should be obvious, says Isaiah. Created from the dust, yes. Animated and alive by the breath of God himself. Someone greater than us is holding the universe in his hands. It's the Lord, the King of kings, our creator God, the one who did not need to be made. The one who made all things from nothing by the power of his word. The one who now sustains all things. To quote Elvis Shocko, when we were chatting in a walk in the park a little while ago, he said to me something like this, it seems to me that people who have faith in science are people who know very little science. The more science I understand, the more I know I don't know. Or, as Bill Bryson concludes, the upshot of all of this is that we live in a universe whose age we can't quite compute, surrounded by stars whose distances we don't altogether know, filled with matter we can't identify, operating in conformance with physical laws whose properties we don't truly understand. Who measured God? Not Bill Bryson. Not you. Not me. God measures the universe. Secondly, God owns the world, so the world cannot buy him off. Verse 15, as you look down at it, is very similar to verse 12, but it's not quite a repetition. repetition. Here the point is not so much God's overseeing power, but his ownership of all things. It's not simply that God holds the universe, but rather that God carries around the stuff of the world, like you and I would carry around water and dust. The point is driven home in verse 16, when we're told that even if you burn all the wood of Lebanon and sacrificed all of its animals on the fire, still you would not own God, nor would he owe you anything. Because, think about it, the wood and the animals were already his. They were being carried around by him before you killed them and set them on fire. And besides, verse 17, they are as nothing in comparison to him. They are nothing and empty. This is brilliant, and it's so important for us to grasp what Isaiah is saying. Isaiah here knocks all religions, including quite a lot of false versions of Christianity, on the head in just these three verses. How? Well, think about it. The very idea that you can perform certain deeds, enact certain rituals, or offer certain good things to God in a way that he would then owe you something is utterly ridiculous. Say that in your next RE lesson. Solomon, when he first builds the temple, centuries before Isaiah, when it's completed, he says, this cannot contain God. Even the world cannot contain God. The Apostle Paul, when he's preaching in Athens, a city which he sees is deeply religious because they've got idols all over the place, and he says, I'm going to declare to you the God who you think is unknown. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. He's not served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Here it is. God is before all things. He's above all things. He is self-sufficient in his own being, of infinitely more value than all the stuff of creation, so he does not need you or me. He did not create us to fill a void in his existence. And he's not looking to us to kind of prop him up. He doesn't want us to offer grand gestures of worship to buy him off with religious duty. As if somehow we could twist the arm of the God who owns everything by offering what he already owns. Imagine it like this. Imagine you're nine and you want to pay rent for your room, okay? So you go to your parents and you say, listen, I've been thinking about it. I'm going to pay you rent for my room. Now, two things are gonna be wrong with that. One is, you are gonna grossly underestimate exactly how much it costs to run your room. Almost guaranteed, right? It costs way more than you think it does. But the other thing is, if you offer to pay and you try and pay, the money that you have comes from your pocket money, which comes from your parents anyway. You can't do it, can you? But that's exactly how we treat God. We think that, you know, if we pray five times a day, if we go on pilgrimages, if we fast, if we sacrifice, we can buy him off. 
You know, if we go to church, if we read our Bible, if we help others, well, if we lead the good life, then we will get the good things we deserve, won't we? And Isaiah says, your God is too small, right? The God who is there, the God who made the world from him, through him, and to him are all things. And he does not need you. He cannot need you. Let's just kind of ponder and chew on this for a moment. This is really important for us to drive home, isn't it? We are often drifting into this wrong way of thinking about God. Even when we've been Christians for years, we still can begin to assume that it's our works for him which control him. You know, that if I'm doing badly in life, it must be because I've done something wrong. Or if things are going well in my life, it must be because I'm being rewarded. You know, I must keep up this really nice, sorted Christian thing because, you know, I've got to pretend that God owes me. And Isaiah says, no, no, no. That's making God way smaller than he actually is. That pretends that we can limit God's freedom and bind him to do our will by our own offerings. That's blasphemous nonsense, he says. God is free, free to obey his own will. He's not captive to your will or mine. And besides that, what can I offer to the one who owns all things? I don't have anything that's of value to God. I need him, but he does not need me. Finally, we, uh, God made us, we cannot make him, verses 18 to 26. Again, the logic of the passage here is absolutely inescapable. God is the one who holds the oceans in his hand, who is of greater value and glory than all of his creation. Then it follows that you and I cannot make a God from the things that we have lying around. What's interesting, though, as you look at the detail of these verses, it's not just the making of an idol that's being ridiculed, it's the making of images. So it's not simply that we are being commanded not to have any other God before the God who made us. Of course, that's the first commandment, and we are instructed not to do that. But here as well, the second commandment is in view, which tells us that we should not make images of God and pretend that those images somehow teach us what God is like and give us insight into him. Why? Well, because Isaiah says God is incomparable. He's not like anything we can make, verse 29. And again, it should be obvious to us. Look at verse 21. He's almost sarcastic, isn't he? Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Have you learnt nothing? This is opening your eyes 101. It's he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Oh, it's really very simple, isn't it? God is the one who is greater than all things. He makes, sustains, brings to nothing. Then you cannot compare him to anything, verse 25. You cannot make anything, you cannot draw anything, you cannot build anything and say, this is what God is like. This is what he looks like. It's interesting, I think, as contemporary Christianity seems to be less and less rooted in the scriptures, as we become more and more suspicious of the written text of the Bible, uh, images start to stand in, don't they, for reading and studying the Bible. You know, look at this piece of art. Hold this object. Listen to this music and let your mind wander. Asking people what they imagine or think of when they think of God. What do you think God might be like? Well, says Isaiah, all of that is nonsense. God is way too big for your imagination, way too glorious for anything that you could draw or make. But then, almost as if to, to prove his point about being unable to draw a God, but also to appeal to that kind of visual learner in us, he says, verse 26, if you do want an image for the greatness of God, it's not an image of him, but it is an example, a visual image of his greatness, then step outside on a clear night, look up at the stars, and ask yourself through the lenses of the Bible, who made all of them? Who knows all of those by name? Who sustains their presence? Who makes sure that none of them are missing? God does. You can't fit that in a stained glass window. You can't fit it into your imagination. 
But that's exactly what God is like. Alec Mattia puts it like this in his commentary. God originates everything, maintains everything in existence, controls everything in operation, and directs everything to the end he appoints. Now, just as we finish, let's remember the point of all this. Isaiah is not writing this to crush you and I beneath images of the greatness of God. Although, to be sure, it's right that we feel the weightiness of this this morning. We are trying, aren't we, with words to describe the greatness of God, who is unfathomably greater than anything I can say to you. But the point is this, is not to devastate us, but rather to grow our trust in his promise of comfort. Isaiah, remember, is chasing out our inner Zechariah's, our, come on God, really? That godless tendency that we all have to think that the scope of God's work is limited to the rules of the world as we understand them. You know, that hesitation in our faith, which you know, looks at our world and thinks, God couldn't really, could he? A miraculous child, an atoning death, a resurrection from the dead, a return in power. God couldn't do that, could he? Forgiveness for all of my sin. Eternal life in a heavenly kingdom, richer and brighter future than anything I can imagine or build now. Really, God, could you do that? A life more real, a curse lifted, no less days to sing God's praise than when I'd first begun. Really? A promise of God's presence with me so that not only will I find in my darkest moment that he is with me by his spirit, but that I'll actually find that especially in my darkest moments, I know that the son who suffered is with me by his spirit. God couldn't do that, could he? And Isaiah 40 says, just look up, will you? Look up, will you? Look around you. God made all of this. He owns all of this. He sustains everything by the greatness of his majesty. Nothing is out of place. Nothing stands in his way. Nothing is impossible. At the end of Luke chapter 1, you hear Zechariah when he's finally able to speak again. He had a nine-month lockdown of silence, if you like. And he tells us in Luke's Gospel that he opens his mouth and speaks by the power of the Spirit and prophesies, and he strings together a whole load of Old Testament sentences, as if to say, oh, all right, I've been thinking about this. And he says, God has done exactly what he said he would. He spoke, he promised. He acted. I should have expected nothing less, says Zechariah, and neither should you or I. Listen, if you're not a Christian this morning, let me ask you, please, just to take a humble look at the world around you and ask yourself, who did all of this? To whom does all of this belong? Is it possible that the God who ordered all of this also has the power of speech? That the God who made us, is also the God who speaks to us and comes in the person of the Son, a miraculous baby born to save. It actually takes a whole pile of quite random faith to disbelieve. And the call of the gospel this morning is simply to look, to listen and to hear, to doubt your doubts and trust in Jesus. And if you're a Christian this morning, the message is very much the same. I don't know whether your experience is the same as mine, but the world, the flesh, the devil, they come, don't they, and they say, come on, Steve, not really. And here Isaiah 40 says, look around you. God is greater. His grace can be trusted. The owner of all of this speaks and saves in the person of Jesus. Trust him, will you? Let me pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, what an awesome and kind of dangerous privilege it is this morning to be stood here trying to describe your greatness. Forgive us, Lord, that we even begin to think that we can get a grasp or a handle on your majesty and your glory. But we thank you that in your great mercy and condescension, you have, by your Spirit, spoken words that describe you so that we might understand just 
a small amount of your glory and your might. Thank you that your greatness is painted not only on the pages of this book, but even in the very atoms that make us up. Your sustaining of the world around us. Your involvement both in the very small things and the very great things. Thank you that your presence is inescapable. Give us, we pray, the humility to acknowledge your greatness, that we might trust your promise. I pray for the folks gathered here and watching this morning. Please, with all of the different things going on in our lives, help us to lift our eyes and see again your majesty and your glory, that we might trust in you, the God who is free and keeps his promises. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to listen to uh, Navcha sing again for us uh, the words of this brilliant song of Creator God um, telling us and reminding us of the truths that we've looked at in Isaiah 40. now going to pray. Dear God, loving Heavenly Father, thank you that you are bigger and greater than we can even think, Lord. 
Help us daily to, to try and know more and more about you so that we can praise your name and, and be even more joyous, being able to share even more with one another about how wonderful you are and how amazing you are and how you work into our lives in so many amazing ways, Lord. We, we can never praise you enough, Lord. So often we can go through whole days and we'd, we forget to pray, we forget to read your Bible, Lord, and we know that we cannot earn our salvation, Lord, but help us to, to be able to want to read them so we can praise you more, that we can just, just see the beauty around us, we can see the, the wondrous things that you do in our own lives and the people around us, Lord. So just we give you praise for who you are, and I know how wonderful you are, Lord, but uh, the more we, we see you through the Bible and we realise that we are, we are so far short of who we should be, Lord. So forgive us for, for our so many sins that we do when we, uh, we treat each other badly and we just we sometimes disregard you and we just don't give you the time that we should, Lord. So forgive us. Thank you that you still forgive us, Lord. Thank you that it, it's, it's amazing grace, Lord, that, that you died on that cross knowing that we would still fail, that we would still do wrong and yet you still went to that cross Lord thank you for forgiving us Lord and thank you that it's, it's forgiven and forgotten Lord thank you that you've buried our sin as far as the east is to the west Lord that when we come again in repentance we know that you're not going to hold it against us it's going to be thrown away Lord and we'll see it no more help us to live lives knowing that we are redeemed Lord Lord we we know that this world is not our end destination, Lord. We know that one day we will be, as Christians, if we've put our faith in you, Lord, one day we'll be able to sing praises and be with you in heaven, Lord. So please, warrior on earth, help us not to settle for the rags that the world's got to offer us compared to, to what you've got, Lord. Help us to live in, in the light of knowing what we've got ahead of us and to prepare ourselves for that day, Lord. It's, it's been a really hard year, Lord, and uh, even in this hardship, please help us to see you and to continually fall in love with you. We, we see so much apathy towards you, Lord, and now more than ever, we need God-fearing leaders to make wise decisions for the good of everyone, Lord. We just pray for the wisdom for our leaders with how to uh, distribute the COVID vaccine, how to, to manage the rules around that. Brexit going on at the moment, Lord, with, with the tight deadlines are coming up, the effects on the economy, so, so many things. And we will all disagree about how things should be done, Lord, but ultimately we know that you alone are, 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 are the, you're the wisest, Lord, and we just wish that and pray that our leaders would look to you for, for help in these times. But ultimately we, we ask that you would let people see their sin and their need of a saviour, uh, in this room today, Lord, we just pray that if those aren't yours, aren't Christians, Lord, that they will see their sin, but crucially not just look at their sin, but look at you willing to, to take that all away, Lord. And for us, our Christians, help us to daily just repent of where we fall short, Lord. As we look closer to home, we can, uh, we also want people to be saved, Lord, but sometimes we just, we sit in an armchair and just, just almost want you to do all the work, Lord, but use us, you re really use us, Lord, particularly this Christmas time. For the nativity this afternoon, Lord, just pray that you'll just be with the team in, in putting that on, but we need your Holy Spirit to be at work, Lord. Help us to, to invite people, help us not to be afraid to, to post on social media or to invite people, knowing that we can only invite, but Lord, but your Holy Spirit can convict and, and save, Lord. And this Christmas time, help us not just to look out for ourselves and our comfort, Lord. Help us to think of others who, who need help and to, to, to be there for one another, Lord. Think of those who find it particularly hard this year. We think of the Pegrims, the Butchers, Elizabeth Lawson's family, Rosie and the girls, Lord. Just pray for them in particular in, in, in their losses over the last 12 months, Lord, that you'll just give them extra comfort this year. And, and let them know that you are with them as well as their church family. And we think of the Shockos and their move and just, just be with them.
Lord, as they, they've got so much change coming up, that as they move into the capital, you'll keep them safe, keep them trusting on you, and that you'll provide for their needs, Lord. And our own church leaders here, we just, we just pray for wisdom for them, because 2021 is so unpredictable what's going to be happening next year. To so give them wisdom and how they uh, maybe adapt how church works or when the restrictions ease, how that happens, what, what as a church we need, Lord, just give them the wisdom in that. And as our church family, help us to, to become more and more a reflection of you, Lord, and how we are amongst one another, that we will be able to support each other. It's, it's so easy at Christmas time to think of what we want, and we can treat you as, as someone we only come for when we want selfish things, Lord. We, we've got nothing to give you, Lord. So please bring us continually back to you, particularly this Christmas, Lord. And in those moments where we want to, we're ready to boast in our efforts, turn those boasts to praise, Lord. When we're about to have arguments over board games or who washes up, Lord, let us see this as an opportunity to be selfless and peacekeeping, Lord. And as we fill Christmas with the fun, food and all this festivity, Lord, help it not be a time that as, as the country relaxes the restrictions for five days, Lord, help that not be a pause on you as well in our own lives. But thank you, Lord, that you never forget your people. Thank you, never change, Lord. Thank you for all you do for us. Amen. So it's the uh, end of church for uh, this week. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to do the Lord's Prayer. So I'm just going to go right here so I can see it. And if we all do that together, hopefully those online are doing it as well and uh, it will be an encouragement to each other. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, as we go out, uh, the usual rules, please don't congregate just outside the church. You can walk off in groups of six, but the emphasis is on the going away, not the staying outside. Remember, smile, wave at the camera. I always get feedback from my niece when I wave at the camera. Um, so people are watching, so wave at the camera, give a, give a good uh, cheerful send off for them as well. Um, so we'll start off with the first row if you want to head off. Row two. And don't forget the nativity this afternoon. Row three. Row four. Wait, 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 one moment, guys. The, the, the power is in the microphone. <laughs> is it all clear? Cool, next row. <laughs> okay, next row.
And last but not least, back row and Rachel at the very back. Come live. 